This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word, to dwell in your word, and your word breathe into us. Lord, we believe that all scripture is God breathed. So Lord, breathe upon us now that we may be better, that we may be more like you, that we may live like you, we may talk like you, we may dwell like you. Lord, we just want to be like you. We don't want to do anything else. We want to be like you. We want to live a saved life. We want to live a worshipful lifestyle, Lord, a lifestyle worthy of the calling of Christ. So, Lord, we thank you for this time to study your word, to hear what you have to say for a time such as this. It's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. We thank everyone who has come to worship tonight as well as those who are tuning in on live stream. Do me a favor, whether you're in the sanctuary or you're at home. Please share with your friends. Uh, press the share button in the lower right hand portion of the screen and share, share, share. This word is not just for you. Don't be selfish. Share it with somebody else and allow them to get the same word that you've pressed your way to get. It is essential that we're in Bible study, uh, not just leaders, but all people, disciples, study and are disciplined in the word of God. Here we are in James. We've been in James for a few weeks now, and we're still in our series of faith that works, of faith that works. And we're speaking of the practical faith that James speaks about in his book. Uh, James writes James, and he tells us all about uh, life with Christ. So here we are in James chapter 3. We've been in chapter 1, chapter 2, and here we are, chapter 3. As you know, in our series, we go chronologically as best as the Lord allows. James chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greatest condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in the word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to brittle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with the small helm, whithersoever the governor listeneth. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that defileth the whole body and set it on fire, the course of nature, and if is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast and birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and have been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Verse 8 again, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. God's word for God's people. Praise be unto God. Tonight our teaching subject is respectfully watch your mouth. Respectfully watch your mouth. We realize that we live in a world of sound bites. We live in a world that you have to say the right thing at all times because someone can take what you say and run out of context. You watch the news. You see it every day. We take 10 seconds of what somebody said, and now we say they're a heretic. Or we say 10 seconds out of what somebody said, and we've judged an entire hour-long sermon. Or not even that, an hour-long interview. We've taken all of what they said and confined it to 10 seconds or 30 seconds or however much we paid attention. Sometimes we say, did you hear what so-and-so said? And all we did was scroll past it and we heard five seconds and we judged their entire being off of five seconds because we live in a world of sound bites. In other words, we live in a world where you have to be very careful of what you say because what you say out of context can have an entirely different meaning. 
But you're not the only ones. The word of God is just like that. That what the word of God says out of context can mean an entirely different thing. That's why context is key when we realize where we are in the word of God. James, again, is speaking to the Jews. He greets them in verse 1. My brethren... He greets them with a term of endearment. Again, I told you, James is the one. He kind of pulls you in, and then he lets you have it a little bit. James says, my brother, and I'm talking to you. I want to at first get this term of endearment out. I'm writing to you, and I'm getting ready to instruct you in this way. He says, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Some versions of the Bible, the King James says master. Some versions of the Bible say teachers. And what he says is don't rush to be teachers. Don't rush to do what you think. Y'all, my grandpa, uh, my grandpa would always say when I was growing up, don't rush it. It's okay. God's, when it's time, when it's God's time, he's going to open up that door for you. When it's God's time, he's going to do this. Don't rush what God was saying. And when you're growing, when you're growing, you're like, man, man, why, why can't I want it now? And I want it now. Or uh, God, I thought I should have this now. And my grandfather said, don't rush. He says, don't rush. Don't worry. When it's the right time, God's going to do it. Don't rush. When it's the right time, God's going to open that door. Or don't rush. Don't rush to get to a space because every space comes with greater responsibility. And what James says is, don't you dare rush. I know the teacher gets to stand in front of everybody. I know that don't rush to be that person. Why? Because with every great reward, every great uh, responsibility or every great gift, there is a great responsibility that comes along with it. And James simply says right here, he says, don't rush it because you're not just standing in a seat where you can say anything. You're not just standing in a space where you can say anything. But when you're a teacher in this word of God, when you're a teacher uh, with the responsibility to speak where God says to speak and be silent where God said to be silent. He said the responsibility is much and not only that, but the condemnation is greater. There's a greater standard upon your life. He says, don't rush. And y'all, maybe it's not to be a teacher of the gospel, but there's some places in your life where you have to beg yourself. You have to train yourself not to rush it and get there when God gets you there. Why? Because there are some things that have to be worked out inside of you before you ever take that next position, before you go to that next level. Y'all, I realize that so many times in life, just like James is speaking to us, many of us are in a rush to go to the next level and we've not gone deeper in God. So he says, don't you dare rush to go up. You need to go deeper. You need to go deeper. You need to get all you can. Uh, I've learned in my life, in my time, that y'all, sometimes you need to get all you can where you are because the next level has a new devil. You've got to get all you can where you are because you'll be rushing up and then you'll feel, then you'll, then you'll not be able to handle where God has placed you. You have to be patient. James has talked about patience in chapter one, chapter two, and here he is again saying, don't rush the process. Y'all, I know we serve a God that can do it immediately, but James says, don't rush the process because you're sitting there wanting to get to this space, but this space requires a lot of you. And the truth is you're not ready. You're not ready to handle what this place uh, requires of you. And so what he says is not only that, but Realize that the word of God is not just a word of God that makes you worship. It's not just the word of God that makes you wave your hand. But the word of God comes as a warning. We don't like warnings because it makes us feel like, well, hold on. When is this coming? How is that coming? James has to send warning because he does not want them to step into something they're not called to. He does not want them to step into something that they cannot handle. James says, now I have to warn you, don't rush and then he goes on, he says, I'm going to tell you why you shouldn't rush. The Bible says in verse two, for in many things we often or we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and also able to brittle the whole body. He says, for in many things we often or we offend all. In many things we offend all. Y'all, what I realize is that as he's talking in context about teaching, he's saying with our words, we offend 
all, that everybody at some point offends, not just um, when you say things that are sinful, when you do things that are sinful, you don't only offend yourself and you don't even just offend the other party that was involved. You offend God. He said you offend all yourself, mankind, as well as God. He said all are offended at some point. You offend at some point. We've all offended at some point. And he says, this is why you have to be careful of wanting to come into this teacher position. You have to be careful of wanting to be there because you're held responsible for what you say. You're held responsible for what you do. You're held responsible for how you live. You are responsible. It is no one else's responsibility for what you say. Now, and I often say that I'm not responsible for how you feel, but I'm responsible for what I say. I have to be responsible with my speech because one offensive word can send somebody into a downward spiral. Have to be careful and have to realize that your words do have power. He says in verse three, no, verse two, we'll stay in verse two. It says, if you find anybody who does not offend in word, that's a perfect man. But this is the part. He says, not only is that person perfect, but they're able to brittle or control the entire body. So what does James say? James says, if you can control your mouth, you can control your body. So what does that tell us? That a lot of our sin, a lot of our mishaps, a lot of our problems start with the tongue. He says in verse three, behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Not only this, y'all, we must not only realize that we have to be careful with our words, but we have to know that our words do have power. Uh, I know we, we always quote it, the power of life and death is in the tongue, and we always use it uh, when somebody speaks a curse over somebody, somebody cusses at somebody, you know, don't say that, don't, don't say it's going to die because power of life and death is in the tongue. But y'all, we have to realize that we have not only the responsibility of taming our tongue, but if there is power and if there's power of life and death in the tongue, that means that we have power in what we say, the words have power, and that means means if we can tame our words, then we can tame the power that God has given us. Oftentimes, power is mismanaged. Power is misguided by what we say. What we do is oftentimes dictated by what we say. Some, a lot of times we talk before we do. And James is getting ready to show us how dangerous the tongue is. We have to be careful to not stop at our words have power. But y'all, our words not only have power, but our words produce. Our words produce something. What are the fruits of your words? What have you spoken over someone's life? What have you spoken into someone's life? Just as the tongue has the power and uh, has the power to to uh, set free as the tongue has the power to heal as words have power to do great things oftentimes our tongue is quick to do the worst thing and that's why good news travels slower than bad news the bible says it here that not only this but james furthers his thought and he says that if um he says if anyone doesn't offend uh, they are perfect, and if they can control what they say, they control what they do. But then he tells us this in verse 3, that the tongue must be guided. The tongue has a mind of its own. The tongue, the Bible's going to tell us here in a couple of verses, it says, Behold, one, we're already reading the scripture, but James go further and he says, Behold, he wants you to stop. He wants you to see. He wants you to observe. And most of all, he wants you to hold on to what he's about to say. He says that we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. He goes further in verse 4 and he says, Behold, also the ships, though they may be great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm or a rudder with whithersoever the governor listeth. 
In other words, what he says, I'm going to give you two examples of the power of the smallest portion of your body, the tongue. He says your tongue has so much power and he uses the example of horses. He gives us the example of horses. When we think of horses anymore, because we don't typically ride them as transportation, uh, the most, most of the time when we hear horses, we hear horsepower. We think of cars, transportation, going somewhere. He says that not only am I telling you about these strong animals. Horses are strong. They're strong. They're uh, mighty. They they move pretty fast. They can carry a lot of weight. He says, not only am I going to tell you the strength that your tongue has to tame, but he also says, I'm going to tell you of this form of transportation, which is horses. In other words, I'm going to tell you the direction and the guidance that your tongue needs. So he uses a horse and he says the bits and the brittle, just that, you know, that almost, I call it a muzzle, but the brittle that they put on a horse's mouth to direct its whole body. If, the, if, the, um, if, that who ri if that person who rides the horse can control his mouth with that brittle or her mouth with that brittle, it controls the direction of that horse. That horse has to go wherever that captain leads. Then he goes on and he starts to talk about the ship. We can talk about the ship as big as a Titanic and we can talk about a small boat, but the Bible talks about a ship and it says that a small rudder guides this ship in the midst of fierce winds, that there is so much going around this ship and it does not matter how much the winds toss this ship, does not matter how where this ship is going. The Bible says that a small rudder guides this ship. So what does that tell us? One thing is that what directs our lives is oftentimes the smallest thing in our lives, which is the tongue, the smallest part of our body. Uh, some would argue is the tongue. I'm sure there's some bones that are a little smaller, but the tongue has power to guide you, has power to direct you. But this is what I learned, that whether it was the horse and the brittle or it was the ship and the rudder, both were at the direction of a captain um, or whatever you call somebody who rides a horse, sorry. Uh, so you have the horse has to be guided with the brittle, but the brittle is only as important as the one that directs the brittle. And then... The ship is only going in the direction, the rudder only turns in the direction that a captain guides the ship. What does that tell me? That I have all the tools in place to control my tongue, but my tongue will only be controlled if I let a captain guide my tongue. I can't control my mouth. The Bible tells us that no man can control their mouth, so there has to be something that guides you. What guides you? What guides your tongue? Well... For some of us, the devil guides our tongue. For some of us, we guide our tongue. But then for the believer, for the disciple, for one that is going to work their faith, we've got to go to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control against such things. There is no law. So what should guide my tongue? Easy answer is the Holy Spirit. I like the one fruit of the spirit. There are several of them that apply, but the one that I really like is self-control. You have to be able to tr do your best by the help of the Holy Spirit to guide your tongue. Because y'all, truth is that if it was not for the Holy Spirit, we would say a whole bunch of stuff. <laughs> we, I, I know, I know. We're not going to admit it, some of us, but, but the truth is, I'll tell you for myself, that if it was not for the Holy Spirit working in Second Baptist, oh, I would have some things to say. We've got to come to a point where we have to be guided by the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit is not speaking in tongues. Fruit of the Spirit is, is not acting holy, but fruit of the Spirit is right here in Galatians and tells us that one of the most important ones is self-control. They're all very important, but for us, I realize that self-control is what often stops us from progressing forward. He says, you've got to have self-control, Proverbs 21 and 23. Those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from chaos or calamity. Mama would say it easy. Your mouth gets you in a lot of trouble. And the truth is, there's a lot of people that your mouth gets you in all kind of mess. And he says that you've got to guard your mouth and you've got to guard your tongue. What does that mean? 
Am I guarding it from other people or am I guarding what I say, guarding what I do, guarding what I speak about people? We have to learn how to watch our mouths, not only watch them, but guard them, because a lot of us watch our mouths and it just keeps on running. We've got to guard our mouths. Why? Why? We have to guard our mouths from our own thoughts. We've got to guard our mouths from our own feelings, because what I feel like doing is cussing you out. But what I have to do is guard myself and say, that's not what God would do. I have to be tamed by the Holy Spirit. Y'all got quiet. It's okay. None of y'all cuss. What I realize is that we have to be guarded in what we say, guarded in what we do, and we truthfully will find ourselves in better situations if we would just shut our mouth sometimes. Because the Bible says that their tongues keep, uh, those who guard their mouths and tongues will keep themselves from calamity. You're trying to figure out why you always in chaos because your mouth won't stop running. You're always in mess because you're messy. You can't find the gospel because you're always running your mouth on the phone gossiping. It trips me out that we take, we look at Proverbs and we look at it as a bunch of cute sayings, but Proverbs has a lot of good practical faith talk. That if you apply some of the principles in Proverbs, you will find yourself that somebody, if somebody's always talking and do not, if the result of not guarding your mouth is calamity, what is the result of guarding your mouth? Peace, minding your own business, living a quiet life. You've got so much noise in your life and some of us, act, I don't know why they call me. They call you because you messy. They talk to you because they know you messy. They know you won't guard your mouth. Some, you know, you got some of those people that they will talk to you because you're going to say what they won't say. And so he says, you've got to guard your mouth, which means it's proactive. It's not easy to do, but it is possible. You've got to come to a point. We've got to come to a point as a believer. We've got to come to a point that realize that this faith fight is not just against the enemy, but sometimes the faith fight is fighting the inner me, fighting what I really want to say, fighting what I'm really thinking, fighting what I really want to do. Now, the perfect saint, you perfect, so you don't have to worry about that. But for us real saints, we have to realize that sometimes this fight is not easy. But t turning the other cheek is not easy. It's what we're supposed to do, but it's not the easy choice. And what he says in James is simply this. He says that in verse 4, he talks of the ship, but verse 5, he says, Even so the tongue is a little member, boasts of great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindles. He says, this little tongue, this tongue that just won't stop running, this little tongue that won't stop talking can cause a world of trouble for all of us. He says that whether so, uh, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts of great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire can cause. He goes further in verse six and says, the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that defileth or corrupt the entire body and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. What does James talk when he's talking about? He's talking about this tongue. And I'm amazed because oftentimes we want to talk about speaking truth to power and we want to talk about the good things of the tongue. But y'all, James highlights the evil of the tongue. He highlights how terrible the tongue can be, that the tongue can literally ruin everything. This is, he speaks, and when he talks about setting fire, uh, setting nature on fire, it's likened to a forest fire. A forest fire is set with one spark. All it takes is one spark. It's just like cancer in your body. Cancer can spray it. And y'all, we're dealing with some of that right now. That one spark 
can send a fire through the sanctuary. One spark can send a fire through every fiber of this church, every fiber of the church universal. One word can tear apart and corrupt an entire body. So what does that tell me? That not only do I have the responsibility of guarding my mouth and guarding my tongue, but I have the responsibility to guard my ear gates. Not only that, when I say guard your ear gates, that simply means that when you hear that mess coming towards you, you probably should guard yourself from it. And at least if you don't guard yourself and you want to defile your ear gates, then the best thing for you to do is let it stop with you and not get on the phone calling somebody else about it. You have to guard what you hear and guard what you say. Why? Because the entire body depends on your faithfulness to God. Are you more faithful to God than you are to gossip? Are you more faithful to gossip than you are to God? James is challenging us and he's reminding us how powerful just this little tongue is. This tongue is not only powerful, but the Bible says that the tongue is sinful. The tongue, it corrupts the body. And not only this, but the tongue has the power to set the course of one's life on fire. That's NIV verse six and seven. And ultimately, the tongue self-destructs and is cast into hell. He says it here. Verse seven, verse six, and it's set on fire of hell. Verse six, the beginning of verse six. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity, that there's just nothing good that comes out of your tongue. I say it all the time that uh, I know the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. But y'all, that tongue runs without the heart even caring. That tongue can run and it, it the Bible doesn't say that it's just... Uh, it, it uh, enacts sin, but the Bible said it is, the world, it is a world of iniquity, that there is just nothing good about the tongue. That's why you have to say, Lord, guide my lips. Lord, guide what I say. Lord, guide my thoughts. Lord, guide, guide, my, guide my responses today, Lord. Guide my every movement. We take for granted that God is a God, that the Lord is one who will guide every step of your life and y'all sometimes it's not that we need help with our walk we know how to walk sometimes it's not that we need help with our worship sometimes it's we need help guiding our tongue lord guide my speech today because if i do this in my own power i've got some things to get off my chest but lord if i do this in your power i can speak your word i can live your word i can be guided by your word who's guiding your tongue if it's you, then that means you, you just fool. Your tongue is full of this iniquity because the Bible goes on to say, we go verse seven. The Bible says for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and have been tamed of mankind. What he says is he starts to set us. James sets us up because he says now man, mankind has dominion over the beast has dominion over the birds, has dominion over the serpents, have dominions over the sea. And all these things are tamed by this same tongue that we can't control. He says, but the tongue can no man tame. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. This really is sobering and this really tightens our view because we like to think of people as good. We like to think of people as, oh, they always say a kind word. No, if someone says a kind word, the kindness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that's God in them saying a kind word because our tongue is full of poison. Our tongue cannot be controlled by us. Why do you think our mouths run so fast? We don't even have to have all the details we run in our mouth. Girl, I don't know why they, I don't know. They didn't tell me that, but what I do know is we are quick to spread. But he said the tongue is so powerful that it can bring down reputations, that it can ruin lives, the tongues. Think about all you hear on the news, y'all. All the time, on the news, everywhere you look, that they just say, that's why um, you don't have to be convicted 
to already be convicted. I say it like this. You can be, the court system say, it says innocent and prove, until proven guilty. But y'all, the toughest court that we live in is the court of public opinion. That they will convict you before you ever even go to trial. And why is that? Because we convict with our mouths. We just run those mouths all over the place. We don't have to have details. We don't have to have evidence. We just run our mouths and what we think is what we say and what we say kills them and we don't care. Y'all remember the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Words destroy. The Bible says words kill. Words destroy. Words set not only your tongue on fire, but words will set your life on fire. You've seen people brought all the way down off of a rumor. We must be careful with our words. If we're not careful with our words and we're careless of our words, as a believer, there is a requirement on our words. We can't just say, we have to be careful what we say because we can't be deceitful with our words. We've got to be careful with how we live because we shouldn't be deceitful or hypocritical with our words or our lives. He says, not only this, not only can the tongue not be tamed. If the tongue cannot be tamed by man, it can be tamed by the Holy Spirit. That simply means that I need, to, you don't might need help. You don't. I think about needing help. No, you absolutely, I don't care how good and how sweet you are. You need the help of the Holy Spirit to control your tongue. Every single day, every single, everything can be going well and you still need the Holy Spirit to control your tongue because you can't do it, but God can. He says in verse 8, Second half of verse eight, it is an unruly evil. It's uncontrolled. It's so evil that it cannot be controlled. There's nothing you can do. And then he goes on and says, full of deadly poison. Poison kills. This is why I said the tongue kills because venom kills. Have you murdered somebody? Most of us will say no. But have you murdered somebody in your speech? Have you murdered them with your rumor? Have you killed something, murdered, uh, assassinated an assignment with your words? And the truth is, many of us have. I have. You have. And maybe you've never said a bad thing about anybody. More power to you. But the truth is, at some point in our life, I believe that I could get 90% of the room to confess that we've said something that was poison. And not only... This is why the word is poison. Not, this is why the tongue is poison. Not only can we assassinate people's characters, assassinate their reputation, and kill the vision. We can do all of that, but it's poison because all poison doesn't kill. Sometimes poison just makes you sick. We've made people sick with the way we talk about them. How do we make them sick? Because some folks get stressed out when you talk about them. Some folks get worried when stress kills, so we know that. Blood pressure are high because everybody talking about you. We have allowed the poisonous tongue to ruin the body. This, it's so crazy. We've, we, we have 100-something people on Sunday mornings. We ask you to share on Facebook. Now, we ain't going to spread the word of God. We might get 15 shares on Sunday morning. We might only have about six tonight in the house but Lord let me do when these podiums disappeared that word spread all through Maywood we've got to be careful with what we say because sometimes poison has unintended fallout and we experience it all day every day we see the fallout of poison. Oh, they don't come to church because they mad at the pastor. So then I'm not coming to church. And then your crew's not coming to church. And then somebody called you for a ride to come to church and you still didn't come. You blocked them getting the word because you mad. Yeah. Not only you mad, then you kept talking. We are in a 
pivotal point where if we can't control our mouths, the body is going to be corrupted. The body is going to fall apart. The body is going to suffer because you got a few venomous snakes. Can you control your tongue? No, they're not snakes. They don't slither on the ground. Snakes walk too. And James says, if you can't control your tongue, you will corrupt the entire body. James is really sobering us up and saying this ain't all about praise breaks. This is not all about just worship, but this is about a lifestyle change. Can you control your tongue even when it feels better just to get it out? Can you control your tongue? Even if you know all the details, can you control your tongue? Because that's the truth is a lot of people benefit from you not telling your side of the story. The question is, can you know the right side of the story and still shut your mouth? James says, I'm asking you respectively. <laughs> Watch your mouth. Not for me, but for the kingdom of God depends on the saints of God controlling what they say controlling how they live. This tongue is so dangerous that the Bible says that the tongue is hypocritical. It says in the verse 9, Therewith, bless we God, even the Father, and therewith, curse we men, which are made after the similitude or similitude of God. You remember in Genesis, he says, let us make men in our, mankind in our image. Mankind is made in the image of God. And what James says, with the same tongue, you praise God. In the same tongue, you curse what God created. You curse his creation, but you worship the creator with this same tongue. Uh, okay. You, you praise him on Sunday morning, but you cuss out somebody Monday with this same mouth. This same tongue. He said, the same tongue you're killing and the same tongue you're giving life. The same tongue you're blessing God at the same time you're cursing mankind. He said, your tongue is hypocritical. Not just are we oftentimes hypocrites, but he says your tongue is hypocritical. That you're just, you're, the smallest part of you is hypocritical. The nature of you wants to curse mankind but the spirit in you wants to worship God and with this same mouth this is why you must be careful of your speech some of us still got to be delivered from that cussing demon because truth be told we say hallelujah and H and all with the same mouth we say I'm saved and then we say that four letter word that S word with the same mouth. We say we're blessed, but we'll call somebody a B in the same sentence. He says, your tongue is hypocritical. It cannot be tamed. Why can you not tame your tongue? Because if the tongue is sinful and you're sinful, how can you tame? Sin cannot tame sin. He says, the Holy Spirit has to do it. We'll close on in Proverbs Proverbs 26. Well, we'll go Proverbs 16 and then we'll go Proverbs 26. Proverbs 16 gives us a little insight of the power of the tongue. Proverbs 16, verses 22 through 28. Understanding is a wellspring of life unto him that hath it, but the instruction of fools is folly. The heart of the wise teacheth his mouth and addeth learning to his lips. So he doesn't speak ignorantly. They don't speak ignorantly, but they learn before they speak. They observe before they speak. They don't take instruction from fools. Many of us are neglecting the instruction of the word to listen to somebody else's feelings. And you're trying to figure out why they're foolish and you're looking foolish because you've not learned You've not taught your mouth. The wise teacheth his mouth. The wise, where does wisdom come from? The Bible says in James, wisdom comes from God. So the wise, that one that gets wisdom from God, teaches his mouth how to say. You know, 
some of us got Tourette's. I've heard some people put some cuss words together that just don't even go together. They just they can cuss just like it's a uh, it's a own language or something. He said, but the wise person teaches or trains their mouth to say those things of God, trains their mouth to speak holy and addeth learning to his lips. So don't just keep talking, but learn about what you're talking about. A lot of rumors that go around have no basis because it's not even the true story. Take time to learn what you're talking about before you talk. I'm telling you right now, there's so many things that I hear about me, and it's so amazing because 80% of the church got my number. Here, talk to me. We'll learn me for a minute. And then talk about If you're going to talk about me, go ahead. We'll be okay. But at least learn. Take the time to learn. Then he says, pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and health to the bones. So if pleasant words are sweet to the soul and health to the bones, what are harsh words? The opposite of health is death. If you have no health, you have no life. Sweet to the soul. So if, if pleasant words are sweet to the soul, if your tongue says pleasant words and they're sweet, what are harsh words? Bitter. Verse 25, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. He that laboreth, laboreth for himself, for his mouth craveth, craveth it of him. An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and in his lips there is as a burning fire. A, for, a forward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separated chief friends. You remember you grew up and they told you it was rude to whisper in front of people. And the problem is that even in the church, we have folks that whisper. What uh, They whispered, conspired, they told their lies, but God favored me. There's time. Y'all know it. Y'all, I, I know y'all don't like to admit it, but you know it. You've walked around some corners and folks got silent because they saw you. There have been tears all over the church. There's been rips all over, not just this church, but the kingdom of God has been torn apart because of these very things. Not that any action has been done, not that anything really detrimental other than the tongue. The tongue, he says it, an ungodly man diggeth up evil. Always digging for something, always digging for trouble. You know, some people just are not okay with things being well. They got to dig for trouble. Well, I mean, that worked out, but next time it won't work out. How, what, what kind of pessimistic view is that? You're speaking your pessimistic venom on the people of God and trying to figure out why everybody can't get with a vision. Can't get with vision because you're whispering all around, conspiring. He says, not only this, but a so strife and these, these whispers separate chief friends. That we are seeing relationships torn apart by the whispers. We are seeing relationships demolished by the murmurs. We are seeing a body corrupted by the whispering of those that dig up evil. Go to Proverbs 26. And we're done at Proverbs 26. 26, 18, and 19. As a madman who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death, so is the man that deceiveth his neighbor and saith, Am I not in sport? That was King James. English Standard Version says, I'm just joking. In other words, you know, the person that eats you up and then just throws, I'm just joking on the end. They've assassinated you. They've torn you down. They've beat you up. And at the end they say, but I'm just joking. The Bible says in Proverbs that this man 
the person that does that, the friend or neighbor that does that, is the same as someone that shoots arrows and death and firebrands at their fellow comrades. Respectfully, watch your mouth. Why? Because in the church, we've got to stop friendly fire. We're on the same team. Should be working for the same guy. Should be working for the same goals. Should be moving forward in a way that makes sense. But James says if we don't watch our mouths, we'll corrupt the entire body. We'll strip us of great vision. We'll strip us of a faithful forward move. And ultimately, we will sow so much discord that the body will be ripped apart because a few unhappy people and a few folks that cannot keep their mouth shut will eventually see us to our demise. But if we can have a few faithful people that would say, I'm guarding my mouth, I'm not spreading those lies. I'm guarding my ears. I don't even want to hear those lies. Be big enough to say, I don't even want to hear it. Be big enough to say, I don't want that coming near me. Because it is in those moments that we can see an entire work crumble because we had itching ears and a running mouth. It's commonly said, a loose lip sinks ships. And I've learned that sometimes there are people in the body that would like the ship to sink if they can't run it. If they can't be captain, they would like to see it sink. The good news is that can't happen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all you've done. Lord, teach us how to control our mouths. Teach us to control our tongues. Lord, our tongue is sinful, so we know we need the Holy Spirit. Guide us now. Order our steps. Order our speech. Order our ear gates. Protect us now, Lord. Protect us from negativity. Protect us from the pessimists. Lord, protect us from the enemy that would like to sift us like wheat. Lord, our tongue is wicked, but Lord, you were righteous. So allow your righteousness to reign upon us, Lord, that when we want to say, we won't. When we think we should say, we won't. And Lord, when that enemy comes to whisper in our ear, I pray that you will guide us and that you will even cause us to lose hearing for that moment. Lord, and restore us a right spirit. Restore us a renewed mind. Restore us a right speech. Lord, that we may talk like you that we may walk like you, that we may live like you, and we can be like you until we are with you. It is in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. 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 We praise God for that word for all of those uh, who want the opportunity to give. Uh, it is not an ask. It is not a request. It's not a beg. It is the opportunity to sow seed. You can do so via Zelle at church, second Baptist at gmail.com. Church, second Baptist at gmail.com. Our announcement for this week is our Summerfest. We have a jam-packed weekend starting Friday night, 7.30 p.m. Come Friday night, 7.30 p.m. in the church parking lot we will put on a great movie hopefully we'll have a good family time bring your family bring your friends bring your neighbors concessions will start at 7 p.m concessions will have no cost concessions are going to be free to the community because we want to serve our church family as well as this community and enjoy a good family time in Christ. Bring your own chairs. Bring your own chairs. All weekend, bring your own chairs. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, bring your own chairs uh, as we want to make sure that you are seated as comfortably as you want to be. But Friday, 7.30 p.m., we will start the movie. Saturday from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m., we will have all kind of things, bounce houses, dunk tanks, a few surprises, a bunch of entertainment uh, and ministries going forward in song, dance, uh, spoken word, as well as guest appearances by several of our um, local politicians, as well as a few surprises. So we pray that you join us Friday and Saturday, and most importantly, you join us Sunday morning in the parking lot at 1045 a.m. 
Sunday morning, 10.45 a.m., do me a favor and bring five people with you, not just one, bring five. Try your best to bring five people with you. Fill up your cars and get them here. We will be worshiping outdoors. COVID is not an excuse. So worship outdoors. Be in the open air. God will cover you. Wear your mask if you want to. Breathe friendly. Breathe safe. But please come out to worship. Um, COVID is not the excuse for outdoors worship. It does not work. So come on outside. You go to the grocery store. You go everywhere else. Come to worship outside. And if you want to go back home, go ahead. But please come Sunday morning to hear of the love of Jesus Christ, to worship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, and enjoy 